Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, it is so good to be back after having a week off, to be able to take some time off and to go on vacation. Now, I spend most of my time at home studying, doing my homework for my study program. But I did get a chance to go up to Lake Tahoe for a couple of nights, and I'm pretty sure I passed by Verna and Frank as I was driving on Highway 50. So Verna and Frank are now up in Lake Tahoe, and that's a good thing for them. You know, it's always kind of nice to be able to have a change of scenery, to be in a little different place, to kind of clear your mind, to be in a different place to get some new perspective on things. And so whether you are working full-time every day, Monday through Friday, or whether you are working part-time, or maybe you are even retired, maybe taking care of grandchildren and the like, it's always kind of nice to take a break from that regular routine, to do something different, to get a new perspective on things, perhaps to experience a different environment, maybe to admire God's creation, or just to kind of kick back and relax. That's always a good thing, a refreshing thing. It can be a healthy thing because it can give you an opportunity to regroup. And so a vacation can be good. Vacations and being in a different setting have been known to prevent certain diseases. It can help alleviate any kind of depression that you might be experiencing in your life. Today, the theme is following Jesus one step at a time. And as I thought about that, I was thinking, should I speak about the Old Testament lesson? Or maybe the epistle lesson? Or maybe the gospel lesson? Or maybe all three lessons? Or maybe I shouldn't speak at all because Otis and Marcus would be sharing about their mission moment. And so I said, yes to all the above. I said, yes, let me talk about this. So when we look at our first lesson from the Old Testament, from 1 Kings, we see this dramatic, wonderful story. We go back a chapter and we look at the prophet Elijah. And he had this wonderful spiritual victory in his life. You might remember how he challenged the priest of Baal, and then he called down the power of God, and they consumed that entire offering, and all the priests of Baal and the idols were all destroyed and consumed, and the, all the water and everything. That was a great spiritual victory for Elijah. But because of that, Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you, Elijah, and he said, his face to do something. And Elijah was so concerned that even though he had this great spiritual victory, all of a sudden he began to be depressed, maybe doubtful about God and what God was doing. And that does happen to us too at times, doesn't it? There are times where we maybe have experienced something very significant spiritually, only to then feel a very strong letdown afterward. It's sometimes how we might have a wonderful time in worship, and then we might just go home and feel a little down. Or we might listen to some uplifting music, but since we turn it off, our spirit sinks. Sometimes we have those spiritually significant events and then we face with something that is troubling, something that might throw us off our step. We might be challenged in some way. We look at Jesus and how when he began his public ministry, he was baptized by John. And that was a glorious event. He comes up out of the water and the voice of the Father says, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. And the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descends on him and everyone recognizes him. And John is saying, follow him, he's the guy. 
But right after that, the Spirit drives Jesus out to the wilderness. And there, Jesus is fasting for 40 days and nights. And it is in that wilderness that he experiences great temptation from Satan. He goes from this spiritual high, this spiritual significant experience to now a spiritually challenging environment. That happens to us sometimes. It happens now to Elijah. He is so distraught, he's depressed, he runs away. He leaves and he finds himself in a cave. And he's wondering, is God around? But God is there. And he's looking for signs of God. And you see this mighty wind, so strong that it can break up rocks. There's an earthquake that shakes the earth. There's a fire that scorches the land. But he does not find God in any of those. God did not come to him in that powerful form like he did just a chapter earlier. But rather, God comes to Elijah as he's depressed and hiding in a cave, fearful for his life. He comes to Elijah in a low whisper, in a quiet voice. So often we're wanting God to show up, to come to us in a powerful way. We say to God, show me that miracle. Answer that prayer. Work in some miraculous way. We want God to show up and be powerful in our lives. But more often, God shows up. He comes to us in that low whisper. As you hear the word of God read, if you, as you are in prayer, God comes to you in a manger. He comes to you as one who's journeying on the road in Galilee. He comes and speaks to us from the cross. We experience God in a dynamic way with a splash of water, a taste of bread and wine, as you hear the word of God proclaimed. So often, we experience those things of God significantly, but in a quiet manner. It's not the big splash we want, but more often, that's how God speaks to us. And that's how God is speaking to Elijah. He encourages him, go anoint the king and go and find Elisha. I have something significant for you to do. It was the first step in following God. God took the initiative. God always takes the initiative. He finds Elijah. He's the one who sent Elijah to the case. He comes to him and speaks to him through the word. And now he's telling Elijah to keep following and to share that message of following. And he finds Elisha and he throws that cloak on Elisha and says, you are going to be the man who succeeds. You're the one who now has some other responsibilities to fulfill. And Elisha goes and says goodbye to his father and mother. And then what does he do? Elisha was out in the field. He had all these oxen, 12 of them. It was actually 12 pairs of oxen. And so Elisha is coming from a wealthy background, a wealthy family. He owned all those oxen. And what does Elisha do? To follow Jesus, to follow God, he's saying, I'm going to sacrifice all of those oxen. He sacrifices them. They're roasted. He feeds everybody. There's this wonderful feast. Elisha is saying, I'm all in. There's no turning back. I've given and sacrificed everything. Even if I come back, there is no wealth left to come back to. I am serving the Lord. I am giving my all to God. 
he goes on and serves in such a way. No excuses. How different than Moses from a few hundred years ago. Back in Exodus chapter 3, God appears to Moses in that burning bush and God saying, I want you to do something for me. Set my people free. Go to Pharaoh, tell him, let my people go. But Moses says, who am I? I'm a nobody. But God says, I am somebody and I am sending you. Moses says, where have they asked me for your name? What am I supposed to say? And the Lord says, tell them, I am is sending me to you. And Moses says, what if they don't believe me? He says, take that staff of yours, throw it on the ground, it becomes a snake, pick it up, and that snake becomes a staff again. Put your hand in your cloak and take it out, and it's leprous. Put it back. Take your hand out again, and it's whole. And Moses says once again, I'm not eloquent of speech. I don't know how to talk. And God says, I will provide. Your brother Aaron will be the one who will speak for you. No excuses. When it comes to following God, we can't make excuses. God has already taken a step toward you to reach out to you. He's already taken that initiative. We have but to respond. In our gospel lesson, Jesus has this encounter with these men. One says, I will follow you. But he hesitates. The second man says, I will follow you. But first let me go and bury my father. We might look at that and say, well, why would Jesus tell a man to follow him whose father just died? That's kind of inconsiderate. But if you read deeper and understand that more. The custom of burying the dead was that you would do so immediately. After a day or two. What this man was really saying was this. He's saying, let me go back to my father who's still alive. Let me be with him. Let him live out his life. And then after he dies and after I bury him, then I'll come and follow you. He's delaying following. He doesn't want to do it yet. He's making an excuse. He's putting a condition on following Jesus. And then the third man says, I follow you. But first let me go home and say farewell to my family. And another excuse, another condition. He's saying, let me go back to my family and maybe they can talk me out of it. Or let me go back to my family and care for them first because I actually love them more than I love the Lord. Those are the kinds of challenges we face when it comes to following Jesus. But we must remember, God has already taken the first step. He's calling us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We have a Savior who says, I'm calling you to follow me. And it's a gentle call. One that is full of grace. One that is loving and offering forgiveness and life and purpose. That's what God is calling us to do when he calls us to follow him. In our epistle lesson from the book of Galatians. A wonderful book. Verse 1 brings up a whole issue for us about slavery. It talks about don't let slavery be a yoke for you. Don't go back to that. Sometimes people would think, well, is Paul condoning slavery? Of course not. We know slavery is a terrible thing. It is not a God-pleasing thing at all. And what we sometimes fail to understand is that we here in America, we have a history with slavery. Slavery that was based on racism. Slavery that was wrong. 
It's like when the Japanese were interned during World War II, or when the government passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. They were all based on racism and is to be condemned. That's not what the Bible is teaching. And when you hear about slavery in the scriptures, it always says it is wrong. It is always bad. You see, slavery in the Roman Greco world is different than our history of slavery. Slavery in that time was different. A person could become a slave if they fell into debt. If they worked hard enough, they could actually pay off the debt and gain their freedom. Or if you were captured during war, you were made a slave. But when the war was over, you would be set free. Or maybe you committed a crime of some sort, and the penalty would be enslavement for a period of time. Again, you could work that off, pay off your debt. Or one might even choose to be a slave. Some person might be so poor and destitute that they had nothing. No money, no home, no way of survival. And they might choose to be a slave for a period of time so that they could have food and shelter. But they could choose to then become free. So slavery and scripture and during those times is different from what we have experienced. And so as we think about the 4th of July coming up and Independence Day and freedom, it's a whole different kind of freedom. God is setting us free. He's forgiving our sins. And he is saying, I have taken the first step toward you so that you can follow Jesus. The second step is this. You go on to the rest of our lesson in Galatians. In chapter 5, verse 22, then it says, here are all these different sins. Enmity, strife, jealousy, sexual immorality, all of those things that we read. The Lord is saying, those are things of the flesh. Turn away from those things. Repent. Those are not good for you. If you want to follow Jesus, turn away from those. They're not good for you. Jesus has died for those sins. And he is going to rescue you from those sins so that you will no longer be a slave to those things. Jesus has promised to free you and restore you and nurture you back to spiritual health. And then that third step in following Jesus is that through his power, through his spirit, through his word, he's going to remake you. He's going to come into your life and he's going to strengthen you so that you will now bear fruit. The fruit of the spirit, of love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. God is going to work in you so that you will bear fruit, that you will have a fruitful life, that you will have a life that is not just for yourself, but that these fruit may bless other people. That's what God is intending to work through you. That's why God wants you to follow him so that you may end up being a blessing to others. So we follow Jesus, one step at a time, knowing the first step is God stepping to us, reaching out to us, calling us to repent and to put aside those things of the law and to receive His Spirit and to bear fruit to bless others. And that's a wonderful thing. That's how. We follow Jesus one step at a time. Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, God save your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.